like right below average. Well, so I feel pretty good considering I didn't look at anything. I took 45 minutes to do it. Yeah. No, that's really good. I feel like that's a better indicator than taking three hours and like having all my notes and stuff yeah. like that. I, I just wanted to be able to study for it and like, like it, was a, it was an actual test and yeah. I feel like that would help me. Yeah. But. Well, let's see, I'm going to go through it and like, figure out why I'm just wanting this and like, get the week and then go back and take them again because I won't remember what they were. Yeah. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And then I need to do that and say I'm going to do okay. it. Yeah. Yeah, I got Welcome to Wednesday. Woo! Week is okay. I can't say almost over. That's a lie. That's a lie. But we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, questions. Uh, I wanted to ask you something about um, regarding second degree murder and a, um, and a stand your ground defense. Oh, and second degree geez. murder makes my heart go. This because sink. because the case that I'm referring to is out, is in another jurisdiction. It, it comes out of Florida. Okay. And they have second degree murder. Okay. So, would stand your ground be an be a good defense for felony murder here in Kentucky, or for any sort of a murder charge in another jurisdiction? If you <coughs> thought um, that somebody was trying to like rob your store and you were defending your your property. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, exercise the prerogative of, um, of well, being able to and say I'm not going to answer that question. And the reason I'm not going to answer that question is because we will be talking about justification later in the semester, which includes self-defense. It's not the only part of uh, justification, but it's a big part. And it is during that point when we will talk about the role of stand your ground laws as a subset of self-defense. So what stand your ground laws do is they amend core self-defense principles to make them more vigorous, give people the opportunity to do more, to act in ways that are justified self-defense than they otherwise would be able to. So I'm gonna postpone consideration of that until we start something. Anything else? Okay, I promised you that I would give you a rundown of some of the ways in which the Kentucky courts have dealt with uh, EED uh, in under uh, 507.021, 0201A and its companion manslaughter provision in 030. And the test, as you will recall, in, that, in those statutes is that the defendant would be committing murder, but it becomes first degree manslaughter because he or she acted under the influence of extreme emotional disturbance for which there was a reasonable explanation or excuse, the reasonableness of which, of which is to be determined from the viewpoint of a person in the defendant's situation under the circumstances as the defendant believed them to be, okay? Kentucky Supreme Court has set forth some parameters for the use and application of this defense, and I'm going to give you several of them. First, there must be some, quote, definitive, non-speculative evidence of the provocation or of the disturbance that the provocation produced before a defendant is entitled to an instruction on the issue. <coughs> okay? Right? Um, the way these things work is no case, no instruction should be given to a jury on any issue, on any issue unless there is some evidence from which the jury could conclude that that defense or that issue is, goes the way the party wants it to. EED is just an example of that. And so the defendant has to show there is at least some evidence from which a jury could conclude, ah, there was provocation. A reasonable person would have lost control and, uh, and acted in the way that this person did. Uh, if there's no such evidence, then they're not entitled to the instruction, even if the instruction in the abstract would be right, would be a correct statement of EED, it's not relevant to this case, so you don't get the instruction. Let me give you an example. Morgan versus Commonwealth. In Morgan, uh, the court had a case where the defendant had stabbed his wife 24 times in the back, killing her. 
okay? He challenged his murder conviction saying the court, the trial court, should have given an instruction on uh, EED, okay? Um, there were, I'm gonna let you get seated and situated because I wouldn't want to continue class while you're not ready. that now? Good to know. Um, Decline to give a manslaughter instruction. The, court, the Supreme Court said, we affirm the conviction. There were, as the court put it, no circumstances existing at the time of the killing to provoke or provoke or stimulate such a disturbance. There were no eyewitnesses who could say this is what happened, this was the provocation. The defendant didn't testify to say this is how I was provoked. So it was only speculative at best, without any evidentiary basis, that there was any emotional disturbance, and so no reason to give it to the jury. So your first thing you have to look for, is there some definitive evidence that at least puts it in issue before an instruction could be given? Okay, that's point one. <clears throat> point two, and this will tell you, I hope, why our California case, the Berry case, would not be uh, applied here, the event which triggers the explosion of violence on the part of the criminal, I'm quoting here uh, from the Kentucky Supreme Court, the event which triggers the explosion of violence on the part of the criminal defendant must be sudden and uninterrupted. Must be sudden and interrupted. So if you combine the definitive evidence of what happened as the provocation and the lack of any, uh, lack of any cooling off period, Barry, I think, would not have come out the same way. And that's from Foster versus Commonwealth. Foster against Commonwealth. The defendant can't do about a provocation before reacting, must be spontaneous and immediate to permit, to permit provocation to mitigate to manslaughter. Okay, number three, words may, and I emphasize the word may, be enough in Kentucky or at least enough to permit the issue to go to the jury. In Wellman, W-E-L-L-M-A-N, Wellman versus Commonwealth, the court affirmed a conviction. And here's what it said. There was no evidence that at the time of the act of homicide, there was some event, some act, some words, or the like to arouse immediate, or to arouse extreme emotional disturbance which is absolutely necessary. Okay, so here's a case where the court said there were none of these things, acts, words, uh, a, 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 an event, an act, or words that might have triggered it. So if I'm a defense lawyer, if I'm a public defender or a defense lawyer, arguing in the next case where there were words, I'm gonna say, well, look at Wellman, trial judge. The court said what was missing there, and it's not missing here, so you should t allow words that did exist. He was provoked, he was taunted, he was, he, was, um, he was berated, whatever it is that you have, and say, you should apply that here. So it's an open question. The court sort of implies that words might be enough, but you'd have to try to argue it. And that's a very useful in the kind of case we talked about, where we talked about the situation where the person learns about adultery. Somebody tells uh, uh, you, your husband is cheating with another woman, right? So it's words, it's not the seeing the act in, in being actually committed, are words enough? Some courts traditionally, in heat of passion cases way back, would hold words are never enough. That's open to some question. Okay, so words might be enough. Fourth. There is a clear connection between self-defense, our first question, between self-defense and EED. Because the same act that you might argue, ah, that person attacked me, so I should have a valid self-defense claim, 
could also be an act that you say provoked you, giving you an EED claim. Now, if you're representing a client, you're gonna hope that you'll be able to use that for self-defense, because what happens if you win on self-defense? What's the outcome? Are you acquitted or cleared? Right, if it's a, if at least in, in, a, in a successful self-defense claim, your client is acquitted, because the act is deemed justified, right? AED, Mr. Wiseman, what do you get? Uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> Can't argue with that. Medication. Manslaughter, right? You get manslaughter, first degree manslaughter. So obviously, from the defense perspective, that's a better outcome. All right, so what's the, how, does, how have the courts talked about this relationship? When a self-defense claim fails, the defendant can still be entitled to an EED separate instruction. So you could ask for both instructions to the jury, or if the court says, as a matter of law, this could not have constituted self-defense, so I'm not even gonna give self-defense to the jury to consider, you can get an EED instruction. Here's an example. Holbrook, H-O-L-B-R-O-O-K, versus Commonwealth, the defendant couldn't win on self-defense. Why? He claimed he shot in response to a stabbing, be, uh, uh, right, so that was the provocation. It could have been said, well, I acted in self-defense, I was stabbed, because this is what he did in response to this stabbing. He first shot the victim once in the abdomen. All right, well, maybe that's self-defense. You were stabbed, you responded immediately by shooting the person, so you were defending yourself. But then he shot him seven additional times in the back, killing him, okay? That kind of puts self-defense out of reach for this defendant. But under those, that situation, he can still get EED because the stabbing could be provocation, and if it was immediate and a reasonable person would have responded by losing control. So you want to keep all of those options in mind, right? I'll try self-defense, give it a shot from the defense perspective, but... <coughs> As a fallback position, EED is still available where self-defense fails, okay? Uh, from the prosecution's point of view, obviously you're much more willing to, if you're gonna lose, you wanna lose on EED because your, your murder conviction goes away but you still have manslaughter, uh, whereas if self-defense prevails, you lose everything. So the prosecution's perspective is that EED is much, uh, much worse, okay? Last but not least, I want to just give you a quote, just listen to this, you don't have to get it all down by any means, but it gives you a sense of the way EED works and what it means. And this is a quote uh, from McClellan, M-C-C-L-E-L-L-A-N, McClellan against Commonwealth, this is from 1986. Quote, extreme emotional disturbance is a temporary state of mind so enraged inflamed or disturbed as to overcome one's judgment and to cause one to act uncontrollably from the impelling force of the EED, extreme emotional disturbance, rather than from evil or malicious purposes. It is not a mental disease in itself and an enraged, inflamed, or disturbed emotional state does not constitute an extreme emotional disturbance unless there is a reasonable explanation or excuse therefor. Okay, so what it is, what it isn't, what has to be present, it's a nice sort of quote capturing what EED is all about and as it's applied in Kentucky. Okay, questions about this or anything else on intentional killings before we move on to unintentional Ms. Richter. Just a clarification, on the uh, Foster versus Commonwealth, you said the defendant's reaction must be spontaneous and what was the second thing? Uh, must be spontaneous and immediate. immediate. Not sure that's not redundant and repetitive, but uh, but there you go. Um, in regards to what the, the last quote, when it says it's not a mental disease, what does does the court consider what if the defendant does have a mental disorder? What sort of impact that might have on EED? That's a great question. I, I, I doubt it's ever been litigated in Kentucky. Um, Although, it, because, well, for two reasons. One is that we measure whether or not the response 
to the provocation was that which a reasonable person would have lost control, and we and uh, under. The, um, uh, but it does say in the defendant's situation. So if the defendant has a mental disease or defect, would that be taken into account? I think that could be litigated. I think that could, could, uh, could be argued uh, separately, presumably separately, from a claim of, let's say, insanity or, uh, or diminished capacity because of a mental disease or defect. Um, so I, I think you could say, yes, there was provocation here. It was provocation of a person who was mentally ill, and the, and the mental illness, because you measure it in the person's circumstance, has to be taken into account. That would be the defense's argument. And, the, and, um, and what you want is for the jury to be told, don't, to the, to the best of your ability, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, take, uh, take this, um, uh, uh, when you measure whether a reasonable person would have responded as the defendant did, you must take into account the circumstances uh, of the defendant, including his mental disease or defect, okay. or whatever the condition is. Okay, uh, I think that would be a very interesting case. I can't answer it for you, but I think it would be a very interesting case. Okay. Okay, that leads us to Wolanski, one of the most famous cases. Uh, the incident here uh, was uh, made huge news and headlines. Uh, both because of how tragic it was uh, and uh, the timing of it led to uh, a lot of reform of uh, fire safety rules. Uh, it, was, um, it was no ordinary run-of-the-mill case, uh, the uh, Wolanski case. So somebody tell me about Barnett Wolanski and his business. Um, so Wolanski owned a nightclub, owned and operated a nightclub. Um, and like a week before the incident happened, which was like a large fire, he became suddenly ill and went to the hospital. A little louder? He became suddenly ill. He time. became suddenly ill. So he was not there, right? From November 16th to December 11th, Wolanski was in the hospital. Now, whatever else you might want to say about Wolanski, he doesn't have, he didn't have magical powers. He wasn't able to use, you know, uh, 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 any sort of um, uh, uh, ability to start a fire uh, from a from his hospital bed, right? Because um, this this occurred right in the middle of that on November 28, 1942. And as the court notes, nothing happened that night in terms of how the business was being operated that was not within the usual and regular practice of the business as Wolanski had operated. Why do you think the court went out of its way to make that observation, which appears on page 424? I think because it's not a result of anyone's like, this, like conduct or anything. There was no like, affirmative act that happened to cause this. It was more of a lack of, of preparation on Wolanski's part. What if? the person who did actually start the fire had done something that had been explicitly against the normal business practices or, let's say, the instructions that Wolanski had given to how things should be done in a manual or just in training of employees, that kind of thing. Well, I don't think Wolanski would be totally off the hook, though. You don't think he would be off the hook? Because of the way he knew the building was set up? But but if this person had done something that Wolanski had said specifically not to do, could we say Wolanski did what met or his behavior um, fell to the standard, um, failed to meet the standard that the court sets forth in this case? What, and what would be the other problem with holding Wolanski culpable if under that hypo? Causation, right? How his his departure from any standard of care, right, would not have been the cause. It would have been the departure from how he ran the business. So that's really important. That this is nothing happened here. Now the specific thing that this bar boy did was unusual, but it, there was nothing different in terms of the course of conduct and the way things were handled merely because Wolanski wasn't there. 
merely because Wilansky wasn't there. They just ran this place the way he had set it up to be run, as Richter. Well, could he, like she said, could he not be held accountable at all for having, not having appropriate exits and stuff? Well, that would be a different... You'd have a causation problem. Okay. You'd still have a causation problem if, okay. let's say hypothetically, this fire had been caused by something that was a complete departure from what he was supposed to do, right? I still think I'm, that would be a real problem. That's why the court goes out of its way to say, look, this is the way he set things up to run. It turned out in his absence, but his absence doesn't get him off the hook. Because one of the things Wolanski wants to argue here is, look, I wasn't even there. Hold the people who were there, caused the fire, et cetera, hold them culpable. I, you know, I was in a hospital bed. How can I possibly be responsible for something that happened miles away? Well, why? Because you set up this system. As you're saying, all of the things that were in this place are part of that, not the whole of that, but part of that. Okay, so he's in a hospital bed. Everything is running the way he set it in motion to run. And, um, um, and um, what happened? And this was a foot. By the way, this football game. What would you imagine it was? This was not in November. This was 1942, well before the first Super Bowl was 67. I want to say so. We're a quarter century or so prior to the Super Bowl. Anyone? Uh, no, no. But you're closer. I'm sorry? No, it was in Boston. Uh, I want somebody to Google this. Somebody Google so, Coconut Grove Fire. That's right. Boston, Boston, College. Boston College. Boston College versus Holy Cross. And it was huge. Right? College football was king. And somehow Boston College and Holy Cross was like a big deal. So it was a very different time. It was a very different time. And, you know, everyone was out celebrating this game. Right? That was one of the reasons that this nightclub was so crowded, because Boston College and Holy Cross were playing. Oh, oh it seems kind of amazing today. All right. Um, now, this match and the fire that it caused, we'll talk about how the fire started in a minute, it was especially disastrous, as Ms. Richter's question suggests, because of the layout of the club. Um, tell me what, there's a lot of things that are in the excerpt that I'll sort of fill in for you, but tell me what you did get in terms of the physical layout that made things not just bad, but catastrophic. So the main entrance was on Piedmont Street, and then... What was, a little louder. The main entrance. Yeah, what about and it? And it had a revolving door. What, and what so? Um, it was... Explain to me why that's part of the problem. Because that was like the only like, entrance really. That <coughs> what happens with a revolving door in, a, in an emergency like this? Isn't it? It locks. Usually it locks. I'm sorry? Uh, Anyone? The traffic got backed up and they all rushed through it at one time. How many people at most can go through a revolving door at once? Really got it very I'm sorry? Ten. <laughs> I want to see you try to. I want to see you and nine of your friends try to go through a revolving door at all at once. Okay. Because a revolving door has like three. A revolving door has like three compartments, right? Yeah. And you can, yeah. How many people can fit in each one as you walk through as it's spinning? Two. Two, Two at the most. <laughs> and hopefully, if it's two, it's somebody you really, really like. Because it gets intimate in a revolving door with two people. So when people are trying desperately to get out, as smoke is building up, as the fire is spreading, trying to get through that door in an orderly way, a revolving door is a bad idea. Unless it, there you make the safety precaution is collapsible revolving doors, where it all it sort of the the the, uh, the uh, sections collapse, so you can now walk through on either side to get uh, in one, you know, out as if it's an open door. So that's one aspect. A revolving door, especially if that's the only exit, 
that is either available or known to people is a disaster waiting to happen. What else? There were five emergency exits, but they were all pretty much obstructed. One was hidden and it was locked shut. And then the other ones were all inward swinging doors, and one was blocked by like, the coat check. Um, Why were these emergency exits, do you think, blocked in the way the case describes? I think probably just Because of the atmosphere. No. <laughs> Think like Wolanski. To keep people from sneaking in? To keep sneaking in? No, but a fine guess. Thanks for playing. <laughs> to keep people from leaving without paying their That's the reason, right? You're owning a nightclub. People aren't going to pay their tabs. You want them to have to go past somebody that is security or the, the, the cash register to have to pay. If they can sneak out the back, they may not. So you block all other exits, right? You block all other exits and you can't, put, you can't man effectively or without too high a cost. And so this prevents people not from getting in. You want people to get in. That's more money for you, but you sure don't want them to get out. And what happens if they can't get out when there's a fire? I'm sorry? And they die. So they cut off exits for pure greed. And, you know, I say it's pure greed, but it's, you know, they did, there's sort of an understandable impulse of not wanting to be cheated and have be stolen, your, you know, people not paying their bills. But this is not the ideal way to deal with it, okay? So that was another problem. Exits were blocked and not well marked uh, so that they effectively weren't in really exits, okay? Um, so as the court puts it, it's not in your excerpt, an emergency escape would be difficult for a patron not thoroughly familiar with parts of premises, of the premises, ordinarily not open to him, okay? Um, and, um, all right, so uh, now what happens? So <clears throat> You may have had up to like 1,200 people in this club because of this football game. What happened? So on the night of the football game, um, there was a, a bartender who saw that a light was out near, um, like a light bulb was out near corn or coconut husks of an artificial palm tree. You said palm tree. Mm -hmm. Palm tree is a great word of the day. Palm tree. Palm tree. Done? Okay. Um, and so he, how does he go to change this light bulb in the dark? He told a 16-year-old bar boy to light it with a match. He says, go change this light bulb. And the bar boy, understandably, has trouble. Why does he have trouble changing the light bulb? By sort of, it works this way, by definition. What happens when a light bulb is out? It's dark, so it's harder to see. Okay, where's that bulb? I can't, it's dark in here, it's a nightclub. So how does he, how does he try to light up the situation? Uh, he uses a match. He lights a match. Uh, and that ignites a palm tree, as you said, and that? Ignites the logo. <coughs> And at that point, disaster is uh, ensuing. The crowd is panic-stricken, rushes and pushes in every direction, a screaming, overturning tables, trying to escape. As we've said, many of the escape doors could not be opened. The door at the head of the Melody Lounge stairway was not opened until firemen broke it down from the outside with an ax, found it locked by a key lock. The panic bar would not operate. Um, and ultimately, some employees and about 500 patrons died in the fire. With what is Wolanski charged? Um, he's charged with um, involuntary <clears throat> manslaughter through wanton or reckless conduct. Okay, good. And he's convicted and sentenced upon each count for a term of not less than 12 years and not more than 15 years at hard labor, sentences to run concurrently. So he's going away for quite a quite a period of time. Uh, so here we have a case where extreme negligence, including violations of the law of the fire code, resulted in death. But it certainly was not intentional on Wolanski's part <laughs> that this should occur. 
Right? So this is not an intentional killing. If nothing else, I don't want to be cynical about this, Polanski doesn't want to kill all of his customers because they're his bread and butter. And it, presumably, he's also not a complete ogre and doesn't want them to die because 500 people dying in a fire is an awful, awful thing to contemplate, okay? So is this criminal culpability? Is it manslaughter? On what is the state's case based? What is the case, what does the state say is the reason he should be guilty? They say that usually, um, like, negligence isn't criminal, but they have their, since he was the owner of a nightclub, there's like a duty of care for the visitors that were invited, um, so that like in any sort of public environment, fire uh, was an ever-present danger. So he pretty much breached his duty to like. And how was it breached? Uh, by not making sure the premises were uh, like safe. Um, by not making and. And to what extent was it, what, what was the extent of his failure? How bad was his conduct? It was an intentional failure to take such care in this which, which constituted wanton or reckless conduct. 